on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. We saw remarkable growth uh, over, over 2020. The indie publishing space was positioned to serve a need no one could have seen coming. Traditional publishers could not keep up with the demand. Of, of course they couldn't. Uh, their model wouldn't allow it. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers. No more barriers. No one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello, it's Friday. It is The Self-Publishing Show, the place where we tell you every week it's never been a better time to be a writer. I haven't said that for ages. Hello, I'm James Blatch. And I'm Mark Dawson. Hello. Hello. Oh. I was, I'm to the point now of writing the front and back matter for my book and I've, I've written the acknowledgements and I've actually said something along the lines of it's a great time to be a writer. I haven't used exactly our line, but... Um, as, long as, he, as long as I'm in the acknowledgements. You may or may not be in the acknowledgements. You have to <laughs> buy a copy at $2.99 oh, at yeah. all good bookshops. Very clever. Um, yes. So uh, before we have our guest today, who is Kevin Tumlinson, old friend of the show uh, from Draft to Digital, we talk a bit to... It's a bit about Kevin's own writing, which I'm intrigued in, uh, about. And Kevin's quite uh, prolific on social media, so you sort of keep an eye on his his nomadic lifestyle as well. But we also talk about draft to digital and the aggregators, one of the places where you can upload your book once and then distribute it wide to very many platforms. I can't remember how many he said now. It might be 38 or something. There's a lot of places where you can sell your book uh, that aren't Amazon, including Amazon. Um, so Kevin's coming up in a minute. We thought we might talk about blurb, Mark, because I've been on a bit of a blurb roller coaster for the last week. Um, it hasn't always been a pleasant ride, but you know, I've done everything I've done with this book publicly. I've taken all the blows. I've rolled with the punches and other cliches. And so I thought, well, I'll put the blurb out there. You told me before the first one went out, I think we mentioned it last week, that it was rubbish and that people would say that, which they did. But uh, the points I got back were very useful. To the point of, but, but one of the problems, I think when you start with something that's probably not right, if you just spend a lot of time trying to reshape that, you're reshaping something with dodgy foundations. And in the end, this weekend, after probably 10 days of ruminating on this and going on and off, I started again. And really, it's prompted by the examples you gave me, particularly that Hunt for Red October, which was basically two or three short sentences. And I really liked it on as it sunk in. Because that's the other thing about this process, I should say now, is when you get criticism, it's so easy. However good I think I am at taking criticism and, and trying to be better at things, you're, you have an emotional response to it, right? You have an emotional, yeah. you're all wrong. Yeah. And I'm right. And it actually... I'm not good enough to dismiss that there. You might be that sort of person, actually. Good enough to just to park that and be business. Like, I have to see, it has to seep through me for a few days. I have to vent, mm. stand up for myself, and then quietly sit there and think, yeah, they're right. So <laughs> it was just a process I had to go through. I don't know if you you have that, but well, no one criticizes you anymore. Too oh, successful. they do. I, I get lots <laughs> of criticism. No, it's, it's, I, I just find it, it's useful to... Um, Blurbs are, blurbs are one thing. And also the position that you're in in the community means that people are going to want to, lots of people will want to help. Other people will want to feel that they are involved in a thread that, you know, is, is quite popular, with lots of interaction on it and, and will want to chuck their two pence worth in. Um, but yeah, my, my view on that is you look at it constructively. People are not doing things. They're not making suggestions because they want to criticize you. They, they are trying to help in that situation. Um, and, you know, I've, obviously I've looked through that thread as well. And a lot of those suggestions I think were not, are not good suggestions, but that's just my opinion. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm, I'm right either, but the, 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 the thing to do is to kind of take it all on board, um, live with it for a bit as you have done. And I think you, you did the right thing. The first one was bad. Um, I, I told you it was bad. And I think everyone else, pretty much told you that it was bad. And the one you came back with, you sent to me on Saturday, was really good. I mean, it was it was a hundred percent better than the last one. Still not quite right, but you know, definitely 
the right direction. And and the feedback you've got when you posted the second one has been much more constructive. A lot of people are just tweaking small things, which is kind of what I would do at this stage. Yes. Yeah. A, a few words, the, the syntax isn't great. I, I'm quite a big one on flow, so I, I like to hear it all in my head as yeah. does that scan, almost like poetry. Um, yeah. Are, are the are the emphasis is falling in the right place, and it, that does that's quite anal, but. I I find that is you, that's a good indication of how something reads, and even this is a small. The blurb is 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 an important. It's a small part of the process, but it's an important part because it does give readers the chance to gauge what your book will feel like when they're reading it. How yeah. how will it read? Is it is it going to be an, a pleasurable read, or is it full of staccato sentences, or too long, or? The grammar's wrong, syntax isn't right, spe- spelling mistakes. You, yeah. know, you didn't have any of those, so you, you put it all together, and and now at this stage, now you you are just basically changing a, occasional words, but you're you're close to the end now. I think you could yes. you could probably park it now if you wanted to, and it would be okay. Well, I've taken on board some of those small syntax changes, particularly with the very top line, which people uh, two or three people came up with the same alternative, which just shortened it and made it less ambiguous as to what what NATO mm. was without getting into the detail. So I, I've t- taken that one and another one, and I've, I've probably rewritten it in that basic form probably half a dozen times on a word, and I leave it for a bit and come back to it. And it's, But I think you're right. I think I'm probably at the point now, as long as I make sure there's, the syntax is basically right and it's got a nice flow, well, I could probably go with it now, and it's not going to be the end of the world even if it, it could benefit from another two weeks of me ruminating coming back but anyway at some point i have to publish oh we have to it's, it's margin it's more, as the marginal what's, gains what's the word? marginal yeah. gains and also the, the 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 biggest improvement was made when you junked the last one and, and came up with the new one so that was a lot of work for significant benefit yeah. the stage now you when you start to make small tweaks the benefit becomes small as well so you but it can still take a lot of time so you have to there comes a point where the increased in incremental improvement is so slight that it's probably not worth the effort to actually do it and yeah. you're you're probably around about that point now or almost there yeah yeah that's a good point uh, one of the things when I was I was because we're also putting together a webinar, which we may or may not do in the next couple of weeks. We haven't decided yet, but we'll we'll probably roll it out in the autumn for certain at the conferences. Uh, and it's basically based on the success we've had with Fuse Books, where I've come at it basic, as a rookie student of yours and implemented a lot of things that you talk about. And we've gone from from hero to zero, from zero to hero, other way around. <laughs> uh, with, a couple, other yeah, way. with a couple of series now, really impressive, um, even though I say so myself, really impressive leaps up in revenue. And so I've been analysing what I've done, which has been a really good thing to do for this webinar. And when I got to blurbs, I sort of took a, a seat back because sort of parked the fact that I was in the middle of my own blurb and, and thought, well, what's the job of the blurb? What's it trying to do? Without looking at Brian and other people who are experts in this, you know, from my experience of, of, of marketing these books. And I think blurbs do a few things, but two really important things they do, just two, I think the most important is they reinforce accurately what genre the book is And that's got a dovetail with the cover. And they've got to give you a reason to read the book. Because what you've got is somebody who's seen the cover, attracted in because they read those sorts of books. They need it reinforced. I haven't made a mistake. This isn't a misleading cover. This is a Cold War thriller or this is a romance book. And then there's the hook. There's the reason to read it. That's not a lot of work the blurb has to do really at that point, I don't think. You don't need long, waxing, lyrical. And I'm not a big fan of the please buy the book line at the end i don't think you see that in traditionally published books no 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 um, you don't, you don't do that that's not no. a great idea at all um so i think and that's why the red october blurb came back to me because i thought it do, i'm using it as an example in the webinar i think it does it so beautifully it's two basically two sentences one that says this is what this book is it's exactly what you you know you might have thought it was from the cover and this is why you should read it uh and yeah that's it's it's, it's, job a, done. it's a really good one no, i um it was one of I, I just pulled. I wanted to see what Clancy did, and it's it basically, yeah. I'll read it now. The hunt is on. Silently beneath the chill Atlantic waters, Russia's ultra secret missile submarine, the Red October, is heading west. The Americans want her. The Russians want her back. With all out war, only seconds away, the superpowers race across the ocean on a, on the most desperate mission of a lifetime. So it's three, cent, four, five sentences, but it's it's less than. It's about sixty-five words. Yeah. Um, so it's, I mean, it's really punchy, but it's it's really effective. No, of course, it, also it's worth mentioning that 
um, with a blurb like that, you're also kind of subconsciously importing the fact that you probably saw the film. So yes. you, you, there is a lot of that. They don't have to say too much because readers will all yes. will just know what what that's about because they may have seen the film. But even if they hadn't, I think that that is intriguing. I'd, I'd be tempted to read that. That's right yeah. in my kind of ballpark. It's quite an old film now, uh, Red October, but um, our generation all saw it. But I'm not sure if the yeah. 25 year old thriller readers have seen it. But um, yes, anyway, so I've been thinking a lot about that, and uh, it was a good uh, good process to go through from a, a learning point of view. And the other thing, of course, about blurb is in six months' time, I can change it. Three months' time, yeah, I can change it. Absolutely. You know, and there's no yeah. reason not to not to try something else. Uh, and my final word on this: uh, when I look at what people say, this works, this this doesn't work. Uh, there's always this question in your mind of, well, you know, what's the evidence of that? How do you know that? And one thing I can tell you from writing a lot of copy for ads, particularly Facebook ads where they rely on copy, is I am very often surprised by what has worked and what mm-hmm. hasn't worked. And stuff I think, I've even had stuff with mistakes in it, which I've then gone back to correct and then looked at the results and thought, you know what? didn't seem to affect it so it's um it's a strange one this and i def- definitely wouldn't ad- wouldn't advise i'd really double check your copy but um if somebody does tell you that doesn't work and this does work they probably don't know what they're talking about is what i'm saying it politely because you know it's it's surprising what works wordy narrative description on one of the books has worked really well in America and bombed in the UK yeah, as I would my, expect it to. My um, view on that is that people who say this is the way, right? Mm. Uh, there is, this has, there's a formula you have to follow. This is, you know, say this, say that, that's just BS, right? That doesn't, that's not accurate. I don't buy that for a minute. It, it depends on so many variables. Um, and what, you know, something really, if, if people follow prescriptive paths all the time, then we'd get, there's no originality. So um, I, I'm not a fan of that. Um, certainly, you know, look at what people in your genre are doing. It's a very good idea to look at the charts, see which ones yes. are selling, and see if there's any kind of common traits that you can see through all of the the top ten books, for example, covers and blurbs, especially. And then, and then you use that as your starting point and work up something from there. But you, there is, you don't have to say line A has to be like this, and then you have the middle paragraph, and then you end with a conclusion based on this. That's that. That doesn't work at all for me, um, and I do. I wouldn't recommend that. Yeah, uh, it is. They are difficult to do. I've you know I've heard people saying that before. It's difficult to write a blurb for your own book, and I'm boy if I. It's very that difficult. Yeah, it's time. very so difficult. So if you're you're going through that, you have my sympathy. I mean, the group is there. It can be bruising, uh, um, but and you've got to be as you've heard. Hopefully, this discussion has helped you pick your way through that sort of critical feedback and and how to use it. And of course, Brian is here from time to time and is a good guy. Uh, so I will have a chat with him specifically about my blurb uh, next time we're on the book lab, um, which must be soon. We must choose somebody else very soon. So one final thing on blurbs before we, we get to the interview. Um, I have been using a, a lady in Salisbury who was introduced to me by a mutual friend and she's done traditional publishing blurbs before. She's she's very good. So she's been doing that just because I can do blurbs, but I just can't be bothered half the time because it is, it is hard work and it's not something that is... I, I quite enjoy it because I, I do like making those small tweaks, but it's a sense of it's, it does take a while. But she wasn't available this time. So for the latest Atticus book, I had to do the blurb and I, and I did it quite quickly. And I'm not saying it's perfect, um, but, you know, three paragraphs with a, with a punchy ending. I probably took about half an hour putting it together and, and didn't obsess about it um, because I'm, you know, I suppose I'm confident enough now. Yeah. It's ex- and, and experience as well. I've done enough of this now to know that, there, uh, there are better uses of my time than than sweating over something for hours and hours and hours. As, lo- as long yeah. as it's decent, and and this is decent, I could probably improve if I wanted to. But it's still, it's sold. Ascus has been in the top two hundred and fifty for the, for a month. So there's, wow. you know, yeah, this isn't uh, the blurb hasn't hasn't hurt it. That's for sure. Now you tell me you've got someone who can do blurbs in Salisbury. She's quite busy, unfortunately. But yes, I keep it to myself. I see. Okay, good. Well, that's uh, enough on blurbs. There'll be um, a book lab along, which is a time we can cover in a little bit more detail uh, in the near future. Right, our interviewee today is Kevin Tumlinson. I'm trying to think where I first met Kevin. I think probably in Nink. It might have been in London. I know we met Dan for the first time in London 
Now, these are the team who run draft to digital D2D. And I think at the beginning, we do explain for rookies and people who don't necessarily know what D2D is and what it does. But we also talked to Kevin, uh, who's a great indie writer, about his own experience writing, what he's doing, and also a little bit about his lifestyle because he's somebody who likes to travel, work uh, on the so You often see him tweeting from the side of a lake. Uh, somewhere and I'm a little bit jealous of that particular lifestyle okay so let's hear from Kevin then Mark and I'll be back for a quick chat off the back this is the self-publishing show there's never been a better time to be a writer KT Kevin Tumlinson welcome back to the self-publishing show it's been been a long time when's the last yeah. time you were on this show was the last I can't time you were in remember. this neck of the woods. No, I can't remember. I, I think can't it might remember. Be. Uh, I was starting to think you guys, I maybe said the wrong thing and you guys yeah. shut me down. Yeah, we uh, we expelled you. <laughs> I can't remember what it was now. That's how long ago it was. But uh, no, right. it, I, I think we had Dan on, didn't we? Just about a year ago, yes. actually. I think a year ago tomorrow we interviewed Dan because it was the day after our conference in London. That's right. And um, it, just before we all disappeared into our homes. <laughs> and uh, are yet to emerge right. here in the UK. Um, but Kevin, I love following you on social media because you are you have a enviable lifestyle. You you roam. <laughs> you are a nomad. Yes. Yeah. We uh, uh, the whole hashtag van life thing. Yeah. Uh, my wife and I started doing that. Uh, actually, and we kind of refer to the van as our COVID escape pod. Mm. Uh, we were able to kind of you know, move around and stay uh, isolated from people and uh, and just sort of enjoy life instead of being locked into a, a house. It, 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 that was sort of by accident because we were already planning to do that when the uh, pandemic hit. We'd just gotten out of our home and gotten into the, the van. <laughs> yeah. So without you, quite realizing that that was going to be the case. So. so do you have a house somewhere? You're in a house at the moment, I can see. We're, but- we're in a house right now. This is not our house. This is my in-laws. Uh, we're building a house in uh, the Texas Hill Country, okay. uh, but it won't be ready until probably August or so. So we're kind of, you know, So you touring. are genuinely fan <laughs> people. The Texas Hill Country must be where the Texas Hill people live. That's, you- uh, we'll just say that's true. Sure. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> sounds like, it a sounds like it has negative connotations though. Is that is there a negative connotation to Texas Hill? No, people? I think it's I think it's the good old folk who keep things simple and there are good people there. I will say yeah. that it's a very um you know, uh, my good friend uh, Michael Bunker uh, lives in the Texas Hill country. Uh te- saying the Texas Hill country is a little deceptive though, because it sounds like you're talking about a very small area where it's actually like a third of the state. Right are familiar with texas that's a it's, that's, it's flat on one side i mean it's a big state i don't i've yeah. never heard of the texas hill country as you know i know texas oh, okay. because my brother still lives actually in in katie and uh right on the suburbs of houston but um i do know texas is pretty flat in places because i fly across it occasionally and yes I, it's very flat where i live here we got a lot in common well that's we, it, we have uh we have every sort of uh environment and uh landscape here you, yeah you can find every well, short of mountains themselves, but we have yeah. The hill country has some hills that that might just be edging onto the uh, mountain territory. But there you go. Yeah. <laughs> right. Anyway, enough of the geography. Fascinating yeah. though it is, and it's it's nice. It's vicarious to talk about it because we haven't been allowed out for so long, and we finally booked some tickets actually for Nink this week. So I'm very very excited about traveling in the autumn. So I can't wait for that. Um, yeah, I'll get to see you there. Yeah, yeah, we'll look forward to that. Now, let us talk about draft to digital Let's talk about the big wide world and yes. uh, all the opportunities there are out there for authors. But why don't we start? Because there'll be people listening who do, don't know what draft to digital is or does. Let's start with that. Oh, man, are there still people who don't yeah, know? Still, what there's only one of them listening, but he's, you know, he wants to know. <laughs> it's key. Well, listen, Guy. Um, so, yeah, draft to digital at its heart, uh, we are a uh, what's known as a publishing aggregator. Um, meaning that you can bring your manuscript to us in the form of a Word document or an EPUB or, or uh, you know, uh, various other formats. And we will convert the document for you for free, distribute it for you for free uh, to all the various retailers. And we don't charge anything at all. Uh, we just take like a 15% cut if you make a sale through us. So uh, we manage a whole bunch of features for you. We got a ton of, ton of free features uh, built and baked right into the service. So, 
Okay. That's, that's the nutshell version of Dragon. That is. Aggregator is the key word there, which is a kind of newish word, I think, to lots of people. But it basically means that you could go to all these sites individually. And there's quite a lot of them now. There's obviously the big ones like Amazon and Kobo and Apple right. and Google. But there are plenty of other platforms, Barnes & Noble, blah, blah, blah. That I was surprised, actually, the first time I used D2D, that the list of potential retail outlets right. is much larger. And there were names there, not being American, names there I hadn't heard of. Exactly. And uh, well, even if you were American, they may be names you hadn't heard of because, they're, you know, like over the past year, we added um, a, a French distributor, uh, Vivlio, which is Tolino's French distributor. Um, and we're constantly doing that. We're constantly looking for new markets, new uh, retailers. We're very, very picky about the retailers we add because we want to make sure authors get paid. We want to make sure that, uh, you know, everything's on the up and up. Their books aren't being you know, scanned and uh, redistributed somewhere on a pirate site or something like that. Like we try to make sure we are protecting the best interests of the authors with the uh, retailers we partner with. So one of the sort of side perks you don't really hear that much about from Draft Digital. Yes. Doing the due diligence on our behalf. Yes. And it's yeah. a job of work, let me tell you. And it, there's been some tragedies uh you know, for example, like we stopped distributing to Google Play because uh, of issues we were having with, you know, price changes and things like that, that uh, we, we couldn't get them to play the same way we needed them to play uh, and all the other retailers play when it comes to our authors. So ultimately, wow. we, we made the very tough decision to stop distributing. Yeah, to that is a big decision because Google, Google yeah. is not a small organization. <laughs> so. They're not. And, you know, they will crush us if they want to. But yeah. <laughs> for now, you know, suddenly you can't be found on a search. Um, OK, well, that's great. Uh, so there's a sort of quality assurance, if you like. Um, right. Uh, helps you navigate that that complex world uh, just on the price model. So 15 percent of the sale. And that's so just so people understand, you sell your book for ten dollars, you're going to get a royalty of a little bit less than seven dollars because there's a tiny delivery fee they take out of that as well. Yeah. Uh, if it's um, on the seventy percent plan, a, a, a major retailer like Amazon, and then you take your fifteen percent out of that royalty. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah. It, you you end up making. I mean, you know, most retailers are giving like thirty five to seventy percent. Uh, you were probably going to make. You know. 60% um, a lot of the time, 60 to 65% a lot of the time, um, if my math is right, and it's probably not. Um, but let's just say we try to minimize that sort of thing as much as possible. And with some of the retailers, uh, and I won't necessarily say who, uh, but you know, some of the retailers, we actually get a better deal for you than you would get going direct. Um, I can't say Barnes & Noble was one of those retailers. Uh, so we, you know, we, there are some advantages to going uh, to those retailers through us, uh, but we don't begrudge anybody going there direct. We actually will help you with that if you want, in a way, because uh, you can use all of our conversion tools. Uh, our we have a, a very cool free layout tool, it's similar to Vellum. Um, if you haven't heard of Vellum, that's a that's a layout tool. It costs a couple hundred bucks, and you can only use it on Mac, but ours can work on any device. I've actually used it on my iPhone. Wow. Uh, so you can, uh, you know, get, get your book laid out, get a, uh, an EPUB for it, get a, a print ready PDF for it and take it directly to retailers. If that's what you want, we don't, we don't own your book. We don't want to own your book. Yeah. <laughs> we just want to help you sell. <laughs> and we should say, so, so just doing the maths in my head, I reckon you work out, it works out about 60% instead of 70% yeah. for, for a retailer that offers 70%. It works about 60% with that model. But here's the thing. If you weren't going to make that sale because you didn't find that retailer and make your book available on it, it's all free money. You know, it's, it's no point in looking at necessarily as, oh, do I want to give away? You've got to do a lot of work by yourself yeah. to get your book in all the places that draft to digital can do with a few right. clicks of the button. Um, right. So that's the way I look at it anyway. Plus, we offer all that, uh, all the sales reporting and everything is taken care of for you. You don't have to go hunt those down and... We make sure that you get paid as soon as as soon as we receive money for you, uh, you get it by the fifteenth of uh, the following month, at the at the latest. So you know, as long as there's money on the account, uh, we we pay every fifteenth. Those are our terms. So if money comes in on the sixteenth, you won't see it until the fifteenth. But if it came in on, on the fourteenth, you see it the next day. So yeah, that's the way it works. <laughs> so that brings us on to 
<clears throat> why people use you and what sort of author uses you. And the big thing, of course, is that if your ebook is in Kindle Unlimited, you yeah. are going to find it less useful as a service because you can't distribute your ebook anywhere outside of Amazon, but you can still distribute the print version. Is it possible to do that uh, using Draft Digital? Yes, uh, we have. Uh, we a couple of years ago we announced our beta program for D to D print. Uh, beta meaning it's in testing, and we're we're working out you know the best way to uh, to eliminate like little little bugs and troubles uh, that really have nothing to do with our service. They're more like uh, problems with uh, distribution and getting author copies and things like that. Uh, we are uh, making some some pretty dramatic changes to D to D print at this moment. So uh, you can still get into the beta. You can still distribute. I distribute all my print books via our service, uh, but it's going to get even better in the next couple of months. I'm thinking like three months or so, I think we're going um, uh, to have almost a total revamp of how we've been doing that service. There's okay. things I can't even talk. There's such, there's, there's ridiculously exciting things going on behind the scenes with DDD print that I, I really wish I could talk about, but we have okay. like NDAs and stuff that prevent that. So well, we'll have Just to talk again. Me. I imagine we'll uh, we'll have a chat uh, over a beer at, and you can spill the beans exactly. at some point in them. So that's, but I think this is interesting. This is an area I pursued with Dan, I think, last year when maybe some of these ideas were sort of embryonic, but... It's just for somebody, and I manage a couple of authors now through our little Fuse imprint, and they're both in KU, but I am right. aware that there's money on the table out there from the print distribution that I just don't uh, I don't give myself an opportunity, don't give the company an opportunity to earn. So I think it's quite a good area. There's a lot of people in KU who could spend one afternoon probably yeah. on draft to digital and just make your book available elsewhere. And if money doesn't come in, you haven't lost anything. Money comes in, that's money that exactly you would not right. have Exactly right, yeah. Uh, you get a so there's a lot of benefits to using D to D even if you are in KU. Um, you can't distribute because you're you're exclusive to, to Amazon uh, except for print. Print there's no exclusivity on print. Um, but one of the things, one some of the advantages are things like uh, you know we have our universal book links which um, you can use to promote your book. Where that's helpful to you is there's two things that I see as being helpful to authors in this space. And one is that you can add affiliate links, including your Amazon associate uh, affiliate account. Uh, so if you promote your book that way and people buy it, you get a little extra kick from the uh, associate uh, Amazon associates dollars. Um, but two, if you do decide to go wide uh, and distribute wide later, you're already set up. Uh, it would just be a click of a button to just go wide. Uh, once you're out of your exclusivity with Amazon, uh, there's nothing to limit you at that point. So there is an advantage to having that. Plus, we have promotion tools. We have, um, you know, our D to D author pages, which are kind of like a website for your uh, for you as an author. Um, you know, tons of built-in tools that you don't have to distribute through us to use. I mean, yeah. We make sure everything is available to these authors for free. Where I know you talk a lot about wide. Versus yeah. exclusive. And um, the funny enough, uh, Mark distributed it recently, posted a link, but Lindsay Baroque and her team on their podcast had a very good discussion, just a sort of hour long, I think it was, discussion on this, which I thought was very reasoned because it isn't a topic that people can get a little bit um, hot under the collar about. But yeah. for you, are you, <clears throat> obviously you're looking at as an aggregator, the wide is the, is the area mainly that you're operating in, people who don't go exclusive with KU. Do right. you as an author... Are you the evangelist for wide versus exclusive, or do you still see it as horses for courses for some authors? I think that um, whether you go wide or you stay exclusive with Amazon is going to be a matter of your strategy as an author and your goals as an author. Um, you can do, you can have a pretty lucrative career uh, being exclusive to Amazon if you if you want. Uh, you're just limited on the audience you're going to get. Amazon, as big as they are, as as widespread as they are, there's there are quite a few markets where they don't penetrate. They don't um, they don't distribute in certain countries. Um, we can get you to those countries, but only, you know it kind of comes down to whether or not you are exclusive. Um, so it's just a matter of, you know, how far do you want your reach to go and what is your ultimate end game as an author? Um, it's not, it's not a bad thing to, to use Amazon exclusivity. I, I have books that are in KU as well. Um, 
because it helped me to build, you know, an income rapidly uh, with a certain series, get it, get it going, uh, fund things like, you know, audio books and things like that. Uh, some of the marketing and everything. And then I slowly start to pull those out and go wide with those titles uh, and I almost benefit from a, uh, a second launch in a way. So, um, but a lot of my audience, uh, you know, a big chunk of my mailing list, uh, despite all efforts, uh, they are primarily uh, Kindle readers. Hmm. So if I'm, you know, if I'm being honest, you know, Kindle is a, is my biggest platform and uh, behind that is Apple. Um, but the, you know, the bulk of readers on my mailing list came, they, you know, for whatever reason, I didn't target them. I wasn't trying to cultivate a list of Kindle readers. They just, you know, happen to be Kindle readers because that's the biggest platform out there. So there's certainly a, an argument to be made for, uh, for exclusivity. Uh, I just think most authors, that's not what they started out wanting. I think most authors were looking for the kind of, uh, you know, the kind of career that included being able to hit bestseller lists, you know, things like that. Um, yeah which, you know, you're a little limited on. <laughs> if you're it's, it's interesting you refer to kind of the regional differences. So yes. here in the UK and, and where you are in the US, you can be a Kindle, you can be a KU reader, right? A subscriber, which I am, you probably are as right. well. Um, and frankly, I haven't read all the books in KU yet. Right. So, you know, no, and I'm not going here. to read 1% <laughs> in my lifetime. So there's kind right. of no motivation to move. But in other parts of the world, it's not, as accessible, not available even, right, and right. also not so much a thing. Um, right. And so they're the areas I think you're referring to as an author. You know, when you sat there pouring over a book, and even I know what it's like. Yeah. Giving birth to a book. The idea that there's people who are just never going to see it really is never going to cross their path very easily in right. in France or wherever. Um, that's disappointing in a way, isn't it? So yeah, I can I think see the... To me, it's always been a, a question of, you know, what, what did I envision when I became an author? And it, it was never, I never had a conversation with myself where um, I said, you know, I can't wait to publish so that I can only distribute to Amazon readers. You know, I mean, that was never, that was never my dream. Uh, so I think for a lot of other writers, that's, that's true. And I think that, you know, this, the, uh, the experience of going wide it's challenging because uh, in a lot of ways, Kindle Unlimited is an easy button. You know, KDP Select is almost uh, an autopilot for some authors to, uh, to make some kind of income. Uh, you still got to market. You still got to, you know, do all the things that all, you know, all authors do. Um, but it does seem like it's easier on that platform because Amazon likes to assist that group. Um, there's all kinds of things that they do to, to nudge readers towards your work. But, you know, it, it, again, it comes back to your strategy. What is, what is your plan for your career? And uh, for me and a lot of authors, um, the plan was to uh, make sure that I, I was available to as many regions as, and markets as possible. So yeah, uh, that's guided my decisions. <laughs> yeah. And of course, there's nothing wrong with doing a mix you can come in and out as a 90 day period uh, minimum, I think to be in KU, but there's no, That's right. there's no harm. For instance, I think it's a fairly common strategy. I think even Mark follows this is to distribute wide for a period of time. And then at some point put the book into, into KU. And that's probably exactly. something I'll follow. I, in May. I've certainly gone uh, in and out of KU with certain books um, over the years. Um, now I think, and, and honestly, uh, one of the things that drove that was the fact that I was, at the time, I didn't have a very wide series or a very deep series, I, I guess might be the way to, to describe it. Like I had um, books, uh, trilogies, a couple of trilogies, and I had some standalone books. But it wasn't until I developed an ongoing series, and I'm at like 12 books in that series now. So it wasn't until then that I, that I realized I had the potential to start breaking those books out of KU and making more money outside of KU than I made inside. So that, that has been a tremendous help. And as those books become free of the KU terms of service, I'm able to take them wide and, uh, and start making a little more um, without being locked down. That's interesting uh, because I think you know, there are people with big series in KU yeah. who seem to talk about doing well, but your experience and you're talking here about that being something that lends itself too wide. Right. Uh, because you can kind of play both sides. Um, cause I, frankly, what I'm doing is treating every book that comes out as if it's launching for the first time. 
And so I have the KU audience already for those books. I don't have to go after those guys. So it actually helps me with, you know, marketing costs because I'm only targeting the, you know, other markets. I'm only targeting the Apple readers and the Barnes and Noble readers um, and, you know, and others. Uh, I'm trying to kind of find a balance there so that I'm not, you know, blowing a bunch of money trying to target every market. Um, So there is that sort of limitation, but, you know, you can get pretty creative uh, with this stuff, you know, as, as Mark, I'm sure would know, uh, <laughs> being the guru of, uh, of uh, Facebook ads and other forms of uh, promotion. But uh, yeah, that's, I, I've been looking at this for a long while. And the strategy that I always promoted was exactly this, get your book, you know, if you are just starting out, KU, um, KDP Select is a pretty good place to start so that you have a, a way to start generating some income for your writing. Uh, but then start th- considering like at what point you need to strategize around this, by the way, you need to plan like at what point uh, am I comfortable starting to pull books out of that system and put mm-hmm. them in a wide distribution. And the answer is not the same for everyone. Yeah. I mean, I was 12 books in before I started pulling Kotler. I, I at first tried to go wide with all those Kotler books and they did okay, but they didn't, they weren't, uh, they weren't generating the kind of revenue I really needed or wanted them at least to uh, generate. So it wasn't until I started strategizing around uh, you leveraging KU and then going wide, which hurts, by the way, because we have a philosophy of, you know, we're empowering the beast whenever we're you know putting these books in exclusive. Like we should all be working to sort of lessen Amazon's power rather than continuing to uh, to use it. But, you know, we also want to put put a roof overhead or buy a van and travel the country things like yes. that <laughs> yes practical considerations how much of right. your time kevin is spent writing and marketing as an author and how much is spent on d2d so uh i'm an early riser i usually get up around anywhere between 4 and 5 a.m and wow. i write until about 9 a.m and then i am on d2d work until uh the afternoon usually around four um and, you know, throughout that, I will, um, I, I do some market, I, you know, I, I try to do at least an hour's worth of marketing work each day for me, uh, but I'm, you know, marketing for D2D all day long. So um, that's not as grueling as it may sound, because, you know, sometimes you, marketing for D2D or me is, it, it comes down to doing something like this, you know, getting on a podcast or writing a, a blog post, uh, something like that. I'm a very fast writer, so... Uh, writing a blog post doesn't take me more than an hour or so uh, most of the time. Uh, so, you know, the, the, it doesn't, it's not quite as uh, labor intensive as it may sound. It's just about keeping plates spinning. <laughs> how, far, how fast are you at writing, writing, writing your novels? Uh, I, if I'm really pushing it, I can do 5,000 words in an hour. Wow. wow. But that's, that's a grueling hour. Uh, so I generally try to aim for 2,000, 2,500 words. Is that typing? Hour. Yes, that's, yeah, that's typing. Yeah. You don't get this kind of carpal tunnel syndrome no, you gotta, by dictation, my no, friend. You've got to um, put some work in for that. See, I, I have to caveat that though, because I, I, I don't want, I hate um, when people talk about uh, the number of words they put down like that and it, it makes people feel like they should be doing that. And I don't think that at all. Um, I think that, you, whatever number of words you're able to put down each day, that is your word count and it's precious. You know, I did, I used to experiment and push myself to ridiculous limits. I have a book I wrote called Evergreen that I wrote in a single day while I was in Manhattan uh, uh, over a Thanksgiving holiday uh, several years ago. And uh, I'll never do that again, but, but that was possible because I kept pushing the limits of what I could do. Can I write a book in 30 days? Can I write a book in 15? Can I write a book in a, you know, a week? Um, and you, the answer is you can, uh, if you've got other things going on in your life, it's very, very difficult to do something like write a book in a week, you know? Uh, but it, it's not impossible. I always encourage authors to push themselves a little. How fast did you write the last book and can you beat it by a day? And if you can keep doing that, you'll improve your, your speed. I hope I write my next book at least one more day quicker than I wrote my last book. Bearing in mind, the last book took 10 years. Yes. 
Well, if you get uh, to nine years and uh, 364 days and you haven't finished, don't, 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 uh, don't feel bad. Pressure's on. <laughs> Just I'm, accept that that's yeah. your rate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how many books do you have out, Kevin? I have in around 50. It's always hard for me to answer that question because I, have, I have books in various stages at all times. So, and I've even pulled some books from publication, um, over the years because I, I now realize some of them weren't ready, you know? So now it's, I've, uh, I've done some rewriting and republishing, uh, Evergreen was one of those, by the way, because, you know, I was so proud of it and I did, I did edit it, but you know, I, it was written in one day. It had its flaws. So I uh, recently went and re-edited that book and re-released it. So yeah, at this point, I always give long answers for short answer questions. <laughs> it's around 50. Around 50. There you go. <laughs> uh, that's okay. Well, it's, it's the detail that's important. Yeah. Um, and you write, is it science fiction? It's not really science fiction. What would you describe it as? I, I write as thrillers. Um, right now, I primarily I've been writing archaeological archaeological thrillers. I think that's why I'm years. looking at it, thinking it might be archaeological. I knew you did sort of um, Indiana Jones type stuff. Yeah, yeah. I've got okay. a new series I launched uh, with a female protagonist that I that I label as escapist uh, fugitive thriller, um, and because she's a and, and a little bit of a technological thriller as well, but uh she's a she's on the run uh and is using an advanced ai she created to keep ahead of the uh, all the alphabet agencies in in the uh, united states so sounds that's great. only two books in i'm really excited about how it's going people are are very uh enthusiastic about, <laughs> about the character and about the books and who are your readers uh you know primarily it's it's I probably have a very similar audience to Mark's audience, honestly. Um, but you know, I, and it's, it seems like it's largely women. Uh, I, I have far more uh, female readers than male readers for sure. So that's because you're a good looking man. I, that could be it. Yeah. Drawn. <laughs> Is that why you came up with the female protagonist or did you just want to write one? Uh, I had several reasons for, for coming up with a female protagonist. One of them was I, I am so, uh, annoyed with female protagonists that I encounter in fiction, especially in films and TV, uh, because there is a real man in a dress feel for a lot of those characters. I grew up, you know, uh, I was raised by my grandmother. Uh, I have very strong female um, influences in my life. These were women who were smart, who were uh, very, uh, you know, capable, uh, who taught me things. I, you know, I learned, uh, certain mechanical skills from my grandmother, for example. Uh, you know, these were, these were women who were strong without having to imitate, uh, someone else. And, um, I was always annoyed because I would come across female protagonists that seemed so shallow hmm. and with no depth whatsoever, no real, Nothing about them. If, if they showed femininity, femininity, it was always to show how weak they were. If they showed uh, strength, it was a masculine uh, sort of strength. It was always, you know, rough edges and and bitter attitudes, and you know, they were somehow damaged f because of their strength. I yeah. wanted to, to have a character who could joke and uh, play, and who understood that she was in trouble, but didn't let it bother her. Uh, and who was brilliant, but was not, you know, she wasn't like some sort of savant or anything. She just, she's a real flesh and blood character um, with real flaws and real strengths. And that's, that's what I was aiming for. Now, mm. I know there, there could be some uh, controversy over that idea of a male uh, writing a female protagonist. Um, I, you know, I've, I've had a couple people say some things, but you know, my hope is that what I'm doing is an homage, not not appropriation. It's also a free world. Last time I looked, you can write a female protagonist I, if you want. I, I, I live in a free world. You yeah. can get mad at me for it, but that's yes. where I live. That's all right. <laughs> well, I always I always go back to Princess Leia in the first Star Wars film. I think it changed right. after that. But there, for me, she did what you just described. I mean, she did do mail things a couple of times. She grabbed the blaster off the men when they were being useless and took control. But her her strengths in that film with leadership. That's what I felt too. 
Yeah, she was the leader yeah. in the room. She knew what was going on. When she sat on the Millennium Falcon, they were on their way back. She knew it was being tracked. She was way ahead of the blokes. And I, right. I, I had a powerful mother as well who was a leader in her field. And that was a really strong impression on me growing up. I think it's, um, I, I feel almost the same influence as you did on that. Yeah. Right. So uh, let's let's just circle back a little bit to draft digital. I'm, I love yes. talking to you about your writing and uh, and your books, but um, and that's a that's an easy way to distract me, by the way, and get me off of D to D is to talk yeah. about my my writing. But yeah, that's what I'm here for. Let's talk about draft digital. Well, you're here for both. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just on the D to D front, I mean, how has it been over the last year? We've seen other organisations reporting a, an uptick, and we've certainly felt that in SPF. I know Twenty Books has, has grown yep. quite a lot over the summer. Has the COVID, the last twelve months, re, is that reflected in your figures as well? Uh, it is reflected in our figures. Uh, it 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 basically trended everything up. Uh, we, you know, we saw remarkable growth uh, over over twenty twenty. Um, and, you know, that was all due, uh, of course, to people being locked down, having precious little else to running out of Netflix is basically what that was due to. Uh, they were, you know, turned into ebooks and, uh, you know, for, for not really the first time, but in a very real way, the indie publishing space was positioned to serve a need no one could have seen coming. Um, the, you know, traditional publishers, could not keep up with the demand of, of course they couldn't uh their model wouldn't allow it but you know we saw people turning to indie published ebooks in a in record setting ways um so and that's that trend has continued to, it, it's tapered off you know we're not seeing as quite a uh, quite as high a spike as we did uh sort of mid 2020 but we are definitely seeing growth i mean we're still seeing growth um our numbers are are above what they've been in in pretty much every year past. So, um, I think it was interesting. I think everybody has discovered rediscovered a love for reading, and a love for great stories, and that is uh, very advantageous to the self publishing crowd because, you know, unlike traditional publishers, we can you know there's so many of us first of all, but we can just keep turning this stuff out yeah. and keep meeting that demand uh so i think it's been you know sort of a I, I i always hesitate to say things like a blessing in disguise about something that has killed so many people yeah. but you know in terms of um not just benefiting authors and benefiting them financially but also benefiting all those readers because this was in an essence i've always felt uh, authors are providing a service, uh, a service of mental health uh, and spiritual health to their readers. Um, I cannot tell you how many readers emailed me just to thank me because I reduced all my prices over over most of 2020 so that people could buy more books uh, without, you know, bankrupting themselves. And uh, I had uh, thousands of readers write to tell me how grateful they were for that. So yeah, this isn't just about the. This isn't just a blessing for the writers. It was a blessing for the readers as well. Yeah, yeah, I completely feel that, and um, and I think you know, in practical terms, self-publishing, the indie author is the is the ultimate agile author. You know, he yes. she adjusts and amends very quickly to the market in the way the traditional industry can't so much, and readers are agile as well. You know, they if they're not going to get to go to the library, go to browse the bricks and mortar. Whoop, Workshops over the first time, bookshops for the first time, they'll get an e-device sent to them and start reading on that. And we've right. certainly certainly seen that. And um, those people, I imagine, will stick with that e-device one way yeah. or another for some time. So there's right. never been a better time to be a writer, Kevin, someone That's once true. said. And, you know, we spent 2020 uh, making sure that we were building things that would help that writer community uh, and help them grow. Uh, you know, we... Over 2020, we released our, we started uh, what we started off calling DDD Spotlight, and we launched DDDLive.com, uh, but we ended up using all those, we were doing a bunch of live streams, what we were doing, every, uh, every, every day for almost three solid months, we interviewed someone from the self-publishing community, and we have uh, started turning all of those into um, a podcast uh, it, we launched uh, a few months ago now um, called Self-Publishing Insiders. 
um, which is, you know, not, it's not just uh, those interviews. It's also our team uh, talking about the industry, talking about what we've learned, uh, that sort of thing. So that's been a big deal. Um, but the thing I think I was most excited about and everybody was most excited about in our company was uh, we finally launched in November. We wa- we launched something that everybody was so anxious for. We've been asked about this a million times, uh, which was our D to D payment splitting uh, so that authors could finally do what they've always wanted to do. We, we constantly have people approaching us about making it easier to do box set releases. And this is um, for collaborations. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and because we distribute to Amazon and Apple and Barnes Noble and all the biggies, um, you know, this was, this was a very big deal. Um, you can arrange these splits with really as many people as you, as you want. Uh, and you can actually adjust the percentages per contributor. So, if you need one to, you know, if the organizer, for example, is going to make more because they, they spent money out of pocket for design and, uh, you know, cover design and layout and all that stuff, uh, then, you, you know, you can adjust that percentage and then everyone else you can split uh, however you need to. So uh, we've even had uh, authors splitting with uh, illustrators, for example. So it's a great way for you to do not just box sets, but any kind of collaboration. So. That's yeah. our, that was our big announcement for, for 2020. Um, and it, it couldn't have come. Yeah, we, we wished it could have come sooner, uh, but you know, it came right at the tag end of the year. Uh, and I thought, you know, what a great way. This is, this was to me a way to provide just that much more hope um, to, yeah. at the end of the year, at the end of 20, everybody was talking about how miserable 2020 was. And we just wanted to do something that told everyone uh, there is hope. There is something, you know, this is our way of contributing, but you know, it's not earth moving and it's not uh, curing cancer or anything, but it, it was a big deal for a lot of writers. So yeah. And can you, can you feed in um, marketing spend into that? So that splits that as well. Mm -hmm. So not directly. uh, And that's something that we could look at uh, in the future. You could, you could always figure marketing costs and just adjust your own percentage. Um, But yeah, no, it's, it's, it's not that developed, you know, it's not that advanced yet. Uh, It's, it was a real challenge. People have no idea how challenging it, this could be because one of the things we had to deal with was taxes. Every nation has their own rules and laws about taxes. Um, So we had to work around all of that. And, you know, if you think dealing with taxes in your own country is a challenge, wait until you have to deal with, you know, several. (laughs) Um, So, you know, there, and there was the payment stuff was, was also challenging. We had some of this groundwork already laid because of our um, D to D shared universes. Um, We sort of built on the backbone of that service. Um, And if you're not familiar with that, that was our replacement for Amazon's um, Kindle Worlds. Uh, So if you were a property owner and you wanted to allow other people to write within your universe, this was a way, uh, we have a way for you to do that. So, and and, uh, share the royalties with the IP owner. So um, we already had some of the puzzle figured out. We knew what people wanted. There were even some people who were using the uh, shared universes it, uh, sort of as uh, royalty splitting. Um, it was, wasn't quite designed for it, but uh, you know, people were kind of figuring some things out, but yeah, uh, we've already had a ton of requests for new features, things like, you know, how can I add a nonprofit as one of my, yeah. uh, one of the uh, payees, uh, you know, and there's some creative ways people are doing that right now as well. You know, if the nonprofit is willing to create a draft to digital account, there's really no problem. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they yeah. can, uh, they can totally do that. Well, I think I think collaboration is another great indie. It's not an innovation from indie world, but it's certainly something that's far more prevalent than it used yes. to be in the traditional. I mean, how often did Roald Dahl get together with um, Jerome K. Jerome and say, let's put a box set together or something. But this, it's a very right. creative way of servicing readers' desires and uh, appetites for books. Well, it's all, it's um, what's interesting in the indie space is that collaborations, box sets, anthologies, that stuff gets used uh, more as a marketing tool than anything. Um, you know, and, and, and in certain respects, it's the same way in the traditional world, but I don't see them utilizing it nearly as well 
as self-published authors tend to do, you know, um, and frequently they'll do things like, you know, we're going to do a box set so that we can get on the USA Today list, for example, um, whether or not, I don't, you know, I don't know where everybody falls uh, on their approval or disapproval of that practice, but uh, it is a clever way to try to, to use that system. Um, I don't know if there's really that much of a benefit there, but, you know, if you want to have that USA Today bestseller on your, you know, as one of your, you know, feathers, yeah. then you can do it. Um, but I've seen people use this for charity, for example. Um, yeah. You know, uh, them, though, yeah. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, uh, you know, and it, there were, uh, we've lost some authors in our community over the past couple of years, even before COVID, we, we lost a few, uh, authors who were beloved by the community. This community is always very fast, very quick to, um, to gather together and support yep. the families of those authors. And so, you know, a tool like this is, is used for that sort of thing. Now we're going to, we're going to box up our first in series and sell it for 99 cents and give a hundred percent of the profit to, you know, the, the, uh, the widow or, you know, the, the widower of uh, this author. And uh, that's that, you know, it shows that this community, not only are they are creative in the way they use these tools, uh, but it shows how much heart they actually have. It's really kind of touching <laughs> to see yeah, that. Happen. It is. Absolutely. Another great thing about this, uh, this indie space that we both enjoy occupying. Yeah. Um, great. Well, I think we were up to date on D to D. I think we did get around to talking about draft to digital. You can, uh, you can tell your colleagues. They'll, they'll be, they'll be so pleased. Yeah. <laughs> did you mention us this time, Kevin? I'll say you, this time I managed to m mention everybody. Yeah. Um, if you know that the, I think what's interesting is the evolution of what we decided was important over uh i i i kind of hate talking about the pandemic really because we all know it's there and we all know what's happening um so i tend to avoid even mentioning it but it is it does it is important to i think it's important uh to point out that one of the things we did early on was start looking at how can we what what is it we can provide for that author community um while this is happening everyone you know if you recall, I mean, everyone was suddenly locked in their homes and, and uh, looking for things to occupy their mind, get their mind off of everything. We decided it would actually, Dan Wood deserves really all the credit for this. Um, you know, he decided it would be a good idea to launch something that allowed us to share the perspectives of everyone in the writing community that we were in contact with, the, the insiders that we knew who could provide tips could provide uh, suggestions, ideas, and resources. Um, so that it was interesting how that evolved because it started off as let's just do this for a month. And then it became two months and three months. And then it was, you know, we've got all these videos and, and all the audio, what can we do with it? You know, so now there's this thing out there that, that authors are finding useful. And it all started because we were trying to find a way distract everyone from being afraid uh so to me that is like the spirit of indie publishing really um you know may, maybe we're not always trying to distract people from a pandemic but we are always trying to figure out you know not just how do we make the next buck but how do we you know how do we assist the rest of the community how do we make people happier uh happier wiser <laughs> and more successful yeah, I'm just having a glance down the episodes. They look great. Some 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 of our friends on there, there's lots of names to recognize and a few that I don't. So it'd be very interesting to delve into that. Um, I need to bring you guys on. Just get you on and we'll talk together yeah. or separately. I don't yeah. care. We'll Yeah, we'd love to. We'll um, talk publishing. Yeah, let's do that. Talk publishing and we can talk writing as well if you like. I'm going to talk. I'm launching a book in May. It might even be out by the time I'm, this. Uh, I'm excited for you. I, I'm, I've been I, waiting for this moment I, for you. I can't tell you I how excited you. I am. <laughs> <laughs> and you've been kind to me. Um, you've been well, encouraging you, and, and keeping me honest. Well, you you were always going to do it. I, yeah. I, I'm a little concerned it took you 10 years, but only because. I think you were you were being your own roadblock. <laughs> yes, I think I had to get out my own way. But I, I didn't to be fair, I didn't touch it for quite a few of those years. Right. I just I just wrote a first draft and then put it in See, the See, but I, here's where I think you're gonna be an inspiration to writers though, James, because if you 
tell that story. So what, what you need to do is create content around that story because so many things happen to you on that journey. You know, you yeah. connecting with Mark, you deciding I'm going to, I'm going to go this way with it. I'm going to put it on pause. And uh, that's the same journey that a lot of authors are on. So it's important for them to hear success stories that weren't overnight. You know, yeah. well, people hear about things like I wrote a book in 30 days or whatever. I, and you get excited, but that's, I completely agree. And, um, and we get that quite a lot from people who say, well, yeah. I can't do what Mark spends, you know, a thousand dollars a day on advertising. I can't compete with that. And we always have to remind them Mark started with $5 a day and lost money. That's where he yes. started. We all started there, but it's, it's very difficult, but I'm in the midst of it now. Yeah. So I think it's a good time to talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Uh, my, my wife is telling me it's tea time. We have okay. Tea. Well, I, far be it for me to interfere with tea time. Do you think that when I say <laughs> as an Englishman tea time, do you imagine me with a cup of like bone china? So, so the, and a cup of the tea? Uh, American in me imagines that you guys are sitting around with a pinky up yes. with a tiny cup of tea. Well, I've got to go and get changed first for dinner. I've got to get changed. Right. But the, yeah. the researcher in me knows that it's, you're actually referring to dinner. dinner. I'm referring to dinner. <laughs> Spaghetti bolognese or something. Yeah, yeah, good. I'm pleased to know. The world is shrinking like that. Um, Kevin, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, can't wait to be with you somewhere in person and, yes. uh, and sharing a beer. That will happen again soon. I, I'm, that will I'm sure. happen. Thank will. you so much for having me. We always appreciate We We love you guys and we actually uh, always appreciate when you have us on. So thanks so much. Our pleasure. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There we go. Kevin Tomlinson, KT. Hopefully we will see him this autumn. <clears throat> we have, uh, just to let people know, I think Katie. we did say... KT. 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 Is there something, you mentioned his lifestyle before. Is this thing I don't know? About KT, yes. He's, uh, <laughs> he's transitioning. So that's oh, very that. good. Um, yes, in the autumn, we are going to hopefully be at Nink in October. Now, I know uh, we've been speaking to Tordra this week. Uh, we're going to be doing some sponsorship uh, with them. And uh, I know that they are restricting numbers at the moment to Nink. But I think 200, that's, yeah. yeah, it seems to be a local rule in Florida. So they're hoping to open that up as we get f closer. Um, but that's a great conference to go to. There is a, um, a membership level for Nink, so you do need to be published and making some money um so they pitch the conference at that and then uh, vegas is for all comers i mean it's for people who are just starting out who just want that kick of enthusiasm at the beginning and there's no better place frankly to get that motivational boost than being in those vegas showrooms so it's going to be in the bally bally's i should say hotel this year so we're excited about that that's in november and frankly mark although it's a nice sunny day today in the uk we do look forward to a little bit of autumnal sunshine don't we in southwest we america do, yeah it is very nice yeah certainly uh, may even get a couple of rounds of golf and you never know yes yeah, so there's some lovely looking courses in vegas as you might expect there's one course i think it's owned by the mgm grand uh, you can only play it by invitation a car picks you up from the hotel it's the only way to get to the course it drives you out oh, to the course wow. and um and then of course the beer cart follows you around but I don't know if we can get invited to... Actually, it looked, quite, us, no. it looked quite tough as well. So maybe we'll choose a nice manicured one that's uh, yeah. easy to play. Good. Okay, I want to say thank you very much indeed to Kevin Tumlinson and the team at Drafted Digital, our friends there, uh, for being on the show. Today, we are back. I think we're talking about a brand new author dashboard that's being released this month, uh, next Friday. So that's an exciting one for us to look forward to. For now, though... Marcus, all that remains for me to say is a goodbye from him. And a goodbye from me. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing, so get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.